So uh, Steven here uh, is a kernel developer, Linux kernel developer, and we rarely have uh, people like him here in Bulgaria. I was really hoping that uh, we would have him for OpenFest this year, but unfortunately he couldn't stay. So the next best thing was uh, to invite him here to Sofia University to show you a little bit of uh, uh, love uh, for the Linux kernel and try to excite you about the Linux kernel. So we were discussing what he should be talking about here and this talk was for me at least uh, the best thing that he can show you here and help you understand why you should join in, right? Yep, okay, let's make sure the mic's, yep, mic's yep. on. Okay, so Steven Rostad. Hi, so uh, my, custo uh, my MO that I always do is I have this camera I don't know if you guys know what this is. Uh, it's like an ancient thing. So, and this is the way you make real selfies. Smile. Perfect. So, I'll upload it. So, as Marianne said, I'm Steve Rosted. I'm uh, one of the Linux kernel developers. I've been, I first played with Linux in 1996 probably before some of you were born. Um, the uh, 98, I started playing around with the Linux kernel, just had a part of my master's thesis. Uh, I actually even did the Linux kernel for my master's thesis. And then I um, can't advertise Coca-Cola. Uh, then I, but we can advertise VMware. Right? No, that's what I work for. So then in um, uh, 2001, I got my first job working actually professionally on the Linux kernel. Uh, porting the TimeSys real-time Linux kernel to various board support packages, so you know different architectures like MIPS, PowerPC, ARM, fun stuff like that. And then I became a contractor, and then I got hired by Red Hat. I'm one of the original developers of the real-time patch, which makes Linux into a real-time operating system. That's what I got right over here. Um, long story, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'm basically here to kind of introduce you to. Um, you know, Linux kernel via tracing, or ftrace. How many people have played with the Linux kernel? Okay, I got, well actually I got a few people, good. Um, so, so some of this, I, I kind of broke it down uh, for people that haven't done much. How many people have programmed in C? Most people? Okay, uh, good. So, first I'm gonna go through the overview of the computer. Uh, one thing I try to tell people you know, when they get into the lower aspects of programming, and not just web development or you know, application development, but actually getting down to the kernel. The, a computer is nothing more than a Turing machine. You have all know what a Turing machine. You've taken classes, you talk about the Turing machine, you, know, you have the infinite amount of tape, and just state machines. That's all, anything a Turing machine can do, a computer can do, and vice versa. So they're equal. And I try to tell people that a computer is extremely simple. It just takes a simple command, add, subtract, shift, compare. It will jump to a different location. It will move that tape, which is usually what we call memory, to something else. So you have, everyone's used to the green part on top, the application. That's where you might be programming. And you might do something like printf, where that talks, calls into a library function that's going to do some magic for you. Or if you want to open, you know, file read, file write, those applications or those uh, operations that you do. And a library is going to do some work for you, so it makes it easier. So you don't have to interact directly to the kernel. But you can bypass the library and talk directly to the kernel. And you can even bypass the kernel and talk directory, directly to the hardware, but that's beyond the scope. So basically, what you're used to, a lot of people are used to is talking to the library, but I'm not going to talk about that today. That's not this talk. If you want to use GDB, it will show you your interface into the libraries. Everyone's used you know, debuggers, GDB. You know, hopefully you didn't get it. Uh, I'm more interested in talking to the kernel. And like I said, I don't want to talk about that. That's, another, that's beyond the scope. So, <clears throat> everyone's familiar with this program, I hope. Uh, it's the most, one of the most famous programs in the world. Uh, it's my favorite. I use it all the time. It's useful, especially for talks like this. And GCC, you know, the GNU, Oh, I call it GNU C compiler, but I guess it's the compiler. I can't remember the exact acronym, but it's not that. And you compile your hello.c, which is, I call the hello.c, not hello world.c. 
So when you run it, it says, hello world. Everyone sees this, very obvious. How many people have done this? Oh, okay. Okay, a lot of people, how many people have not? <laughs> so, so basically I'm talking for you guys. Because um, I'm going to focus down to, this is what you see when you do jump. It creates it into a, what's called an ELF file, executable and linkable format. It's the way it's written in, it's just a binary file written in uh, on disk that when you execute it, you know, you type in your bash command line or however how it gets executed, it goes into the kernel and the kernel will read the header file and know that this is, and knows how to parse ELF files. And it's going to load parts of the file into various segments of memory. And then it's going to jump to a location. In fact, there's the start location that it's going to jump to. If you do read ELF, which is another application, you can actually it'll find, it'll tell you where the starting point is. But look, there's a lot of code before that start. And that's added by GCC. There, there's no hello world right there. But I go to the next page, or oh, before I do that, there's the start fi function, you'll notice right there, uh, it calls into libc. So start jumps in and then it halts after that. So that's your actual program. It jumps into libc that's going to do even more magical stuff, which will call these other functions and then jump to main. Because then it will look for where main is. Here's some more. This is the next page. If, you do, if you're doing a less and you hit enter and you look at the next page, this is what you see, a lot of more junk that you don't care about. Then finally, this is the last page. It's only three pages. Hello world are these three pages when we do an obj dump. And up here at the top, that's your program. That's main. If I zoom in, this is what you see. So this is addresses. This is a machine code. This is the assembly. This is if you're write assembly code and machine code. Now, a lot of times I talk about machine code and people freak out. I actually have to know machine code sometimes for some of the various things I do in the kernel. That's because I, um, I do some strange things in the kernel that most kernel developers don't do. So I'm kind of the oddball among kernel developers, so, so I need to look at the machine code. I actually have to know things, like E8 is a call function. How you, when you call a function, it does the opcode E8. That's very important to us. And you see it right there, E8, it followed by a four byte offset. But that's the machine code for this. So this is what the machine will actually read. Heck, that's in hex. I, think I didn't have enough room on my slides to make it into binary. You notice something here. Put S. Put S is another call. Print F, and you have put S. But we didn't type put S. We type print F. So why is put S there? Now you're compiled with optimization on, but GCC will actually auto quickly automate, uh, optimize because it will look out and say, hey, there's just a string format with no parameters. There's nothing to parse. It actually will know that in the compiling and say, hey, you just print F a string. So it says, why call printf? This is really a put s. All I'm doing is going to write whatever's in that string, which was hello world, and straight there. I'm not going to, why spend computer um, cycles, you know, reading and parsing through the format to find um, parameters to inject into the code? Because that's expensive. A put s doesn't do logic, it just says write out whatever I write. So GCC optimized. So I want to printf. I don't want put s. I want to printf. So I have to go back to my program, and this time I'm going to add a parameter. Now I'm going to do something not normal. Instead of just putting in any old parameter in a variable, like that's boring. If you, I could put an int x, sign x to something, and then call it. Then GC might even optimize it if it notices that int x is a, um, uh, what's it called, if it's a local variable that doesn't get modified. It might actually optimize it, put it into the string, modify the string, and then call put s again. So I don't want that. I want to do something different. I want to see main. What address is this program actually running in? So now what, what we had was this put s. I recompiled it, did an obj dump, and now I got this. I got my printf. See, printf is here. It puts it in the ri, R it moves um, the first parameter. This is the string, it's, which is the string is the offset of the instruction pointer into RSI, the RSI register, which you have to remember for this. Actually, RSI is the second parameter. So this must be the address of this guy. In fact, minus B from the RIP from here probably jumps right to there. So this is the address of the RIP minus B, which is 11. Yeah, which is minus 11. will bring you back 
11 bytes to main. That's, that's the main. Our, the reason why RSI is the second argument. We'll get back to that later. RDI is the first argument, which is the string, and then it calls printf. <clears throat> so let's look at the main here, 1135. Remember that. So what do we expect when we go compile it, rerun, and we run our hello with main, we're going to expect 1135, right? Makes sense, makes obvious, that's the address. This is what I got. You know, on older kernels, I would have gotten 1135. But on this kernel, I got this crazy mess. Funniest part is, I ran it multiple times, and I got a different output every single time. So this was confusing me. By the way, I wrote these slides yesterday. Uh, so I ran it, I have to go look, why did I get a different thing every time, a different value every single time I did this? And you could do this, as long as you have a new, I ran this on the 419 kernel, by the way, the 419 RC5 kernel. And um, I looked at this, but one thing I noticed, all these guys are the same. 135 is the same every single time. So I looked into the code, and I'm like, this is a security feature. And I found out if you go and if I echo zero into a control file into the kernel, it's a kind of an optimization, like a switch that you can have. So I echo into slash proc slash sys slash kernel randomized VI space, or VA space, virtual address space. So basically, by the way, don't do this. <laughs> this is a security feature. <laughs> It's basically, so every time you load, a, uh, load anything into the, um, like execute something, it's going to randomly place it in virtual address space because it's a real, look, uh, L files are made so they can be executed anywhere. That's why you had the offset from the instruction pointer and not just a hard-coded address space for those parameters, for the string and for the values. So when I ran that, it still put in some strange number, but every time I ran it, it was the exact same thing each time. So, I'm sure you guys have seen these things. This is what uh, a page table, a page tables look like inside the kernel. And this is, if you ever do anything inside the kernel, you have to be very much aware of this. Uh, this is uh, how virtual address space gets mapped to physical address space. Now, in physical address space, that's the, um, right here, I know, I didn't, I didn't have much room on the slide, so I made this 32-bit, although this is 64-bit, so just pretend this is 64-bit. But it just made it easier to put on the slide. So I made this 34 phase. This is the whole address, address space. Now, don't think it's memory. It's not, because address space also includes access to devices or access to something else. So it's just basically a space that you could tell the computer or the CPU, go look at something at a line, and something's mapped there. So at boot up, the BIOS will actually map things. It'll map memory to certain locations. It'll, so it ma um, zero may not even be memory. So if you do a null pointer, that's why you'll never have to worry about writing something, because zero, a lot of times, isn't mapped to anything. So if you write there, this will actually fail, cause a fault. So the way we do this is this is a virtual address space, and if I split this up, which I did, this is 564, so I 564, I put it down here, and I broke it up by fours, but I split it in colors because this is nine bits, so I had to break it down into binary. So I translated the hex into binary. These are nine bits, nine bits, nine bits, nine bits, followed by, um, what is that, 12 bits. So this is an index. Nine bits is 512. So the first one is your global page directory, which is put into, you guys don't need to care about this. By the way, just to let you know, I'm just telling you things just to get your, so you're aware of things. You don't, this is not a lecture, there's no test, there's no exam, I don't expect you to remember any of this or learn it. It's just sort of, get your interest. If you want to know more, then all you have to do is go and search the webs and do this. So I'm just, just kind of showing an overview. So ideally, this is the page descriptor table. This is the start of your, uh, basically your address, your virtual address space for your application, which is held on x86 in the CR3 register. So there's a special register on the CPU that's called CR3. You load something in there, the CPU is going to go and look and look for, it's going to be a physical address space. So what, you, what I put in the CR3 register, this is actually mapped somewhere here. So it's going to jump there and expect this format, and this is going to be a table. 
So if I write into a virtual address space, it's going to take the very first byte, by the way, down below it, is the hex of the first nine bits, which is AC. So the index of AC goes down here, and then it reads this physical address space, which is somewhere here, jumps to it, and it's going to expect another table. So I guess the page upper descriptor, so then it does the same thing, 0 and 7, jumps down here, looks up, you know, page middle descriptor, come down here, jumps up until you finally get to your page table entries, and then here, the last one, jumps to actual where the physical space where this will finally map right where you are. So that's just an overview of physical address. Don't really have to worry about this, but just know that what you write in virtual address space is not what you need to know for, um, or is not going to map always to the same spot in physical address space. In fact, it may not map to anything, and when you write to it, it may send a sig or a fault to the kernel. The kernel will say, oh, this memory is actually in your swap partition. And then it will read the swap partition, load it up into real memory, fill in the page entry table, and, say, and then go back to the kernel, and you just happily move on. So that's how swap works. So if you're ever wondering about your swap partitions, that's just mapped out, and all you do is fill, remove the entries here or put a flag there saying, this guy doesn't exist and it's going to fault, and the kernel's going to say, oh, okay, I'll just memory of open. And it could put it someplace else. So you can move these things around anywhere you want as long as it's mapped properly correctly here. So if you have two applications, the same virtual address space could be mapped to do two different locations. So this same address space, if you have application A, application B, application A, this points here, and application B, that same address points here. So there are two different locations same virtual address space. So in address space, usually, again, I'm still doing 32-bit because it's easier. I don't want to spread there. It's like, so you have 0 to some number is your user space. Anything higher than that will be your kernel space. So your application is your main is going to be mapped in user. But the question is, what's in kernel? And that's what we want to find out. So user space and kernel space. Now, there's a special flag set. So what we call in x86 world, there's like ring 0, ring 1, ring 2, ring 3. I guess ring 3 is um, like 1 and 2 is not used. 3 is user space. 0 is kernel space. And it's a mode of, it's just a bit that basically is in the CPU. And when you're not in ring 0, you don't have access to anything in the page tables that say this is ring 0 only. So if you try to access that, it will kill your process if you try to access anything in these ring 0 uh, kernels. Although with Spectre and Meltdown, you could get around that, but that's another lecture. Anyway, so if you have uh, user space, you have your applications. And yes, I know I put Word, uh, uh, Word and Outlook. I, I, it was the first thing to come up on the Google search for images, and I didn't have much time. I wrote this yesterday. Uh, <laughs> so each one has its own virtual address space mapped by page tables, and they don't have access to the kernel. And then say you have something, they, they share a library like libc's you know, uh, dynamically object library. So what we do is those are, that one file is mapped somewhere, doesn't have to be the same place, somewhere in the virtual address space of each of these applications. And when these applications need to do something special, like read a file, read networking, read or send a packet, show something on the screen, uh, take an interrupt or be able to read your um, keyboard, they need to talk to the kernel because all that is done by the kernel. The kernel is the service provider for anything that the applications want. And they do that through system calls. So everyone here should hopefully be familiar with system calls. System calls is the way to access into the kernel to figure out or to be able to get something accomplished that normally you can't accomplish because you have to access something else. So you open a file, read networks, files, and it's an application, it's a application programming interface, API, so that it doesn't change. Whenever you've, how many people have seen or heard about Linus Torvalds yelling at someone? Uh, he's actually a really nice guy now. <laughs> no, but one of the things he used to yell at was when people break applications. You don't break user space. You modify one of these things of the system calls, you will break user space. Um, although the whole thing is, if you break user space and no one notices, did you break it? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Linus has actually said that. He says, as long as no one complains, you can change user space. So you could, uh, the system calls have changed and no one noticed. And it never broke. 
So, how many are familiar with S Trace? Okay, okay, I should probably say how many people are not familiar with S Trace. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're too lazy to open up here, or raise your hand, or you don't want to be embarrassed or something like that. Anyway, S Trace is the system called Tracer. Uh, it's a very, very useful tool. It's very slow because it uses ptrace. Ptrace is what is a utility in the kernel to be able to hook into other applications. You become its parent, and you could monitor it, you could, step, you could stop it, you could step through it. GDB, your debugger, uses ptrace to stop an application. To, you could do everything you do in GDB where you could read memory, change memory, it, have something move step by step or run to a certain point and stop. That's all handled by ptrace. It's a horrible interface. Don't ever use it. Uh, we're trying to find other ways to remove ptrace. In fact, we're trying to work with perf to, um, in fact, if you go to uh, Linux Plumbers in a couple of weeks, uh, is going to be having a session on trying to get uh, strace to use the perf infrastructure so that it doesn't need to use ptrace and it can be much, much faster. Although they said the percentage of speed that ptrace or the strace has slowed down normal not to using strace has actually gotten much smaller. The percentage is actually uh, compared to the way it runs, uh, applications run normally and compared to when running it on strace is actually much closer and strace never changed. What happened was the fixes for Meltdown and Spectre slowed down the interface to the kernel so much, but did it affect strace. So it just, hey, it's, we went from being 30% slower to only 8% slower. <laughs> Not realizing that the whole thing just went a lot slower though. So I ran strace on this. This actually is a full screen. This is actually every single system call called by Hello World. That's, that Hello World does a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of things going on when you run Hello World. And at the beginning, it, here's the exec. B, BRK is where it creates the memory address space for you. And then it's going to check uh, the dynamic linker to load things. This is a library. And these things don't even exist. So it gives you a, nope, oh, we found something. Uh, let's go in, check, and check the status of it. We're going to memory map it. Okay, close it. Access the, uh, another linker, uh, dynamic linker stuff. Oh, that doesn't exist. Oh, do some other things. Uh, M memory map a whole bunch of stuff over here. Close it. Arc PR control L is basically, I have no idea what that does. I looked at it, at the code. It's like a little thing. It's just some info. I'm like, what the heck is this? It's useless. Anyway, um, it protects the memory for security purposes. It'll do M protect. Uh, fstat, brk, and boom, there's our hello world. <laughs> we finally got to something where we could actually write hello world. You know, if I wrote, I could write hello world in assembly in probably five lines if I just wrote it with one system call. I don't need all that. Well, actually, you would get some of the stuff, the brk would actually happen because I think that's some of the things I might do just by loading it, but I could probably do this done in much quicker. I didn't have time to try it. So, that's strace. What about ftrace? This is the official tracer of the Linux kernel. Uh, it's what I developed. It's, um, I maintain it. Uh, this is kind of like what I do. I'm constantly making it better. And the way to get to it is in, it's in your, it's probably on any laptop you have or any box you have that runs Linux. I'm almost guaranteed it's been there since 2008. 2009, oh, 2009, I think it's been into the just starting the distribution. So it's almost been 10 years, nine years. It's been like everyone has it, and it's in the sys kernel debug tracing. Actually, I moved it to sys, sys kernel tracing, but since I can't break user space, when you mount debug fs, it'll actually mount the trace fs directly right on top. And if you want to access this, if you ever get into embedded programming and you want to do um, <clears throat> use busybox. I don't know if anyone knows what BusyBox is. It's basically a very, very minimal um, uh, kind of not, I would say, user space environment. So it's very, very small. It's about as small as Hello World, that, as you can see. And you just do, you don't have much, there's no libraries. You don't have any, everything's linked as one big blob of memory. Everything you can do, ls and all that, is just one thing. So you could use ftrace with only BusyBox. That's why I wrote it, because I was an embedded developer way back when, and I always have a soft heart for embedded development. So I kept it so you could just do it just using echo and cat. 
So if you go to the ftrace control directory, to get there, if you want to mount it, it's this command, like I say, don't remember it, and this, I'll send out the, the slides so they're available. So you just do the mount, the dash T, the tracefs, no dev, to the syscurl tracing. The syscurl tracing directory will just, it's a pseudo directory that the kernel creates for you if ftrace is enabled you'll see that directory. So you just have to look there to see if ftrace is enabled, you'll see that directory there. In newer kernels that created the tracing directory, otherwise you have to mount debug fs. So then I mount it, then I just do ls. Here's all the things that you could uh, do you know, for tracing. Uh, I highlighted some of the things. Now what's really special that Greg, I don't know if you guys know who Greg Crow Hartman is, he's the maintainer of Stable. He was so impressed by ftrace because we're the only one that created a file system with a README. <laughs> the funny, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> the funniest thing about the files, I, I removed this just because it was kind of a joke, but it takes some memory in your space. So I, I removed it, but it was a great joke. Was the first thing in the README was how to mount the tracefs directory. <laughs> Which is kind of pointless because if you're reading it, you already mounted it. <laughs> so if you cat trace, if you go in that directory, just cat trace, you see a header and nothing. So that's not that's boring. We want to do something. We want to see something, ha some action. What do we want to do? So we echo function. This is actually, you could enable, will enable tracing on pretty much all functions in your kernel. And this will go on forever. If you, there's two files, there's trace and trace pipe. Trace, will, when you read trace, that's a iterate, it's, it's a non-consuming read. So if you pause tracing, you could read the trace file over and over again. It's always going to be the same. But to do that, I had to, when you read the trace file, it actually pauses tracing when you're reading it. So you could do it over and over again. If you want a producer consumer where it's not pausing tracing and tracing never stops, trace pipe, you could, there's a trace underscore pipe in your directory. You read that, it's a consuming read, but also it doesn't stop tracing. So you could run that. If you just did echo function, cat trace pipe, it will go forever. It will never stop. It will never, it will constantly, the cat itself reading it will cause events into the trace event buffer and it will just read its cycle itself. <clears throat> to disable tracing, you just do no op current tracer. Done. <clears throat> so, the thing is that we have now is trace command. Uh, this is what I'm going to want to do. This is what some people help back there help me develop, it, develop this. Trace command is a command line utility, so you don't need to do all the work of everything. Because, yeah, BusyBox is great. I'm very still, I make sure that ftrace is still functional for everything I do. We could do with BusyBox, Echo, and all that. But for more normal users like myself, too, I actually don't want to go in and type things and I can make scripts. That's not useful. So I wrote um, a trace command. By the way, I hate the name. There's a historical reason behind it. I'm not going to explain it here, but there's a historical reason, and I was going to change it. I even had on Google Plus, if you guys remember what that is, it still exists, I think. Anyway, um, I had this Google Plus uh, poll about what I should rename it to, and the number one thing that people picked was, keep it the same, my scripts are using it. <laughs> Can't break user space. I was like, oh, I hate the name. Um, so you have to be root to do anything useful because tracing is really kind of, the funny part is I, uh, my, one of my friends, Case Cook, who is like the head of the security of um, Linux, you know, I always laugh, him and I are friends, and it's funny because he's always trying to secure the Linux kernel, and I'm always trying to crack it, break, break, crack it open. I want to see what's in there. I want to see it. I want to modify it. I have dynamically modifying the kernel. Function tracing, think about how heavy that is. You know how that function tracing works? It actually puts, it puts no ops at the start of every function, which is very quick, so it, just, it reads the no op and disappears. But when I enable function tracing, I, modif I dynamically modify the code so it calls a tracer. In fact, live kernel patching, if you ever heard of that, where you actually could send in patches or you actually can patch your running kernel without ever shutting it down, that actually uses the ftrace infrastructure because of the dynamic modification of it. Because you could, once you put in that jump to a trampoline from the entry of a function, you could hijack that function. Because you go to the trampoline, nothing says you have to go back to the function you called. You could go back to a different function. So you could actually, that's how, they, that's how live curl patching works. It takes one function, or it takes a function, looks at it, 
we need to put, makes a fixed function into memory. And when you jump to this function, it calls the ftrace infrastructure, and then it returns to the new function and that, that's fixed. And this function just sits there in memory, taking up space. Well, anyway, trace command you could download from up there, like I said. And it's simple, you do make, make doc. By the way, there's a I try to keep all the man pages up to date. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, they're pretty close. So instead of go using the BusyBuck way, where you mount your file system, you CD to the tracing directory, you do echo function to current tracer and cat trace, you do this. From your normal directory, you do trace command start dash p function, which means p is, OK, it's a misnomer. It's a plugin, but it's not a plugin. So it really is a tracer, but it's still dash p. Dash p function, trace command show, and boom, you see the exact same thing. If your TraceFS directory is not mounted, it will mount it for you. You don't need to worry about that. It takes all the work away from you. So I'm recommending people using trace command. I'm trying to do less talks about accessing the, direct, the, the, direct, uh, the function, uh, the ftrace control directory directly. directly. That's a tongue twister. And <clears throat> so I'd rather use trace command because it makes it a lot easier. So let's look at the syscalls from ftrace's point of view. So I'm running my, instead of um, doing strace, I'm going to run record, trace command record, which records it into a data file. This is another thing that's great about trace command, because you can actually not re worry about the trace file. It, actually, it will actually stream the data right into a, a file that you can analyze later. And it can be as big as you want it to be. You can fill up all your disk space if you want. It's good at crashing machines. So you do this, trace command report, and this is you see, this is all the things it kind of does. This is all the sys enters, sys exits. And I cut this so I could get to the bottom to show you, here's the sys write. This is the buffer. This is, a, if you count that, I don't know, 16 plus 13, uh, whatever, 20, whatever. That's the hello world address. So this is the buffer to hello world. So back to this whole idea of system calls, we have S trace up here that does everything from user space with help of the kernel, but ftrace doesn't need user space. It's in the kernel. It does the view from that. So it's much more powerful. So let's say the whole point of the talk is I want to learn the kernel. I want to know what does write do. OK, we know printf did a syscall to write. I want to know, let's follow that. Let's see what write actually does. So I trace our hello program. And with a function graph tracer, which is kind of cool, but here I do dash dash max graph depth of one. Now, function graph tracer will show you all the functions that are called in like a C format, all the way down, all the way up. It's pretty cool. I, just, I didn't really do a snapshot of it. But if you tell it, give me a max depth of one, it's only going to trace the first function that goes into the kernel and then back. That's it. It doesn't trace anything else. It jumps in because that's all I'm interested. I want to see, right now I want to see what does Hello World do. How does it get into the kernel? Because it shows you something that strace doesn't. Page faults. You didn't see that on strace. So when you, the way, remember the page tables that we had? And what we did before, so when you execute a function, it doesn't load that elf file into memory. It just sets up the page tables to say, this memory location here represents this part of this elf file. And it doesn't actually read the elf file. It's much quicker. Because think about it. When, imagine what you have to think of when you open up Chrome. How big Chrome is. If I had to load that all into memory at one shot, no, that would take forever. So instead, it only loads on demand. Unless you do mlock all, but don't do that. Uh, so it loads on demand. So when it goes in, so here's, you actually see it in action. So, let me see here. So when it actually did a load here, did some system calls here, and it did a load, it actually fault, did a page fault. It actually signaled and went into the kernel, not by a system call, but because it tried to read memory that wasn't there. They tried to execute memory, took a page fault. The kernel said, oh, this, this memory area belongs to this page. It will load the page of memory in and then go back. It go to the next page, fault again. So it slowly, lazily fault on on-demand pages. So that's what that's happening right there. And then it's doing syscalls. I see, 
okay, here's my file, enter access. Let me see if I go there. Oh, let me keep a bunch of, I jumped down because this does a lot more functions because I have a lot of page faults. And finally, I get to, here's my write, here's my sys write, here's my sys enter, and I get, oh, well, there's a do page fault before it, and then I get do sys call 64. Well, I want to know more about what function is being called, but do sys call 64 isn't very useful because I want to know only about the write function. That's the only thing I care about. But all the all sys calls seems to go through this function called do sys call 64. So that's actually the first thing that gets called, and then it probably reads the um, uh, what's it called? I think it's the AIX. One of the registers has the information of where of what system call you're doing because the system call is usually put the value of a system call, which is just an index into a table, and then it does a call, then it calls do syscall, then jumps, does a jump table. So I need to find out more. Am I talking too fast? <laughs> I'll slow down. So what I did instead was I did max depth two. So I want to see not just the function I called, but I want to see the functions that it calls. So you can actually see the do page fault does a tree block, find VMA, that's the virtual, uh, that's basically the find VMA finds is where you're, it's looking up, where is this memory located? It actually finds your uh, ma memory mapping because it's got to load something. So right there, you can actually kind of see what the thing is. Handle MM fault, so it finds the VMA, then it calls this handle MM fault that's going to pull in the memory for you into where it got, has to go. And then, you know, it does unlocks and then comes back. So if, this is a little thing. You can see a little more of what it does without overwhelming you with all the patches, the data. And here, oh, look. It called something unique. I want that, that underscore, underscore, 64, sys, right. So let's look at that function, now only look at that function. So I ran it, and now this is a function graph tracer, tracer in its true glory. I put in function graph tracer, dash G means graph this function only. Ignore everything else, because there'll be too much data. I can't, I can't read it, so I'll just graph this one data. So I said, I only want this file, or this function, and it graphed, you can see all the functions that it called. And the, one of the first things, because, you know, it's writing into this uh, uh, kernel, and the kernel is very, very paranoid. It does not trust user space. So anytime you go and write into the kernel, it's got to verify, are you okay to write? But honestly, I don't care about that. I want to see where the printf goes. So what I did was, I, hello, did I do it? Well, here's the verify write, all the verify write functions. I want to ignore this. I don't care about this, uh, the verify area. So I put in dash n rw uh, verify area, which tells me to ignore that. It actually, the whole graph is disappears. It doesn't trace into it. So that function actually disappeared. You don't even see it. So now I get to look here and, oh, look, I got this. Well, I got to interrupt. So I put in an option. Don't worry about this. Actually, it would have been easier just to put the SMP error up as don't trace that. But I put in no option, and this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It just kind of gets things away, but every so often it interrupts. It's buggy. I have to fix that code. And I ran through So now I got a little, something a little more variable. I go, okay, so VFS write. So this guy calls this thing called VFS write. VFS stands for Virtual File System which basically is the handle for all file, anything in file systems, whether it's, you know, XT3, ButterFS, a virtual file system, they all go through the VFS layer. So the VFS layer will do all this stuff. It does some paranoia checks. For, this is the TTY write. So the console is part of the TTY. So don't worry about teletype, whatever it's called. Uh, old, ancient things. We got to rewrite. We got to get rid of it. But anyway, it's still there. So you get to see what that does. And it does all these things. And this is NTTY write. That's an interesting function. By the way, a little uh, trivia, I think in 2003, my very, very first patch I ever got into the Linux kernel was for the NTT write function call. I have to go look it up again. So I go to the next page, and it goes down further and does this PTY, PTY write, and goes and um, inserts it into some string flag, does some flip buffer thing, and then it queues some work, and then calls some block, but queue work on something. So basically, I think what I'm assuming is it's putting it someplace, putting data somewhere, and calling something else to process it. It goes further down, and then there's the TT. This is a try to wake up. So it's actually waking something up. Whatever it's waking up, I don't know. And then it goes on further and say, OK, wait, oh, here's do output character. So that must be important. I don't know what it does, but it must be outputting some character. And then it, it flips, flips you off some more, and push. 
does some more insert work, adds some more stuff, goes, now it looks like I'm coming out of things. There, that's it. That's all the right system call. You'd think it was easy. That was a lot. So what do we learn? First of all, we learn system, the system call right is way too big. So it writes the standard and puts it in some buffer. And it wakes something up to do something with that buffer, but we still don't know what it did with our buffer. Like, okay, it wrote to the buffer. So system call right went somewhere. What do we do? We need to dig deeper. deeper. So let's say I want to start seeing what else is there. So instead, oh, by the way, let me just go back. One thing I didn't notice to tell you, that dash keppel F that was there, that means follow this program and don't trace anything else. So it actually filters everything else, but does it, does it, it only follows that one program. So now, after I go up back here, I removed it. I want to see all programs, but I'm only going to trace certain events. I'm going to trace when something gets woken up and when something gets scheduled out. So the CPU, you know it's a scheduler. CPU can only run one task at a time, even though you see your Chrome and your clock. A lot of those things look like they're running at the same time. Multiprocessors, yes they are, but not always. Um, if it's a single processor, it may still look like it's running one at a time, but it's just basically doing a very little bit, then a little bit, little bit, and in your mind, it's going so quick, it looks like it's simultaneous, when it's really just very serialized really quick. So. I want the scheduler so I could see actually how things switch. This is a lot of data. You see everything? Everyone understands everything that's in that slide, right? Good. TMI. It's too much info. So when you do trace command record, you get a lot of information. And that was just on, what, three events that I traced? What was it? Yeah, three events. Sked wake up, sked switch, and these are not even common events. I mean, they, it's common, but there's other events that are even more busy or busier. So, sneak peek. Um, so, it's too much information. We need a way to visualize it. Uh, it takes an expert to dig into something that complex. And we don't want to be experts, we just want to learn. So, introduction to Kernel Shark, which has got a new facelift, thanks to Yarnan over there too for uh, rewriting it. In uh, cute. I started it a long time ago, and I never had time to work on it. Thanks to VMware, we got funding to hire someone full-time to rewrite it from scratch, and it's going to be doing a lot more in the future. But right now, the first thing we had to do to get Kernel Shark 1.0 out, which we're still at 0.9 because we're, we're tweaking, we're still fixing bugs, but once we get that out, it's going to be just as equal to and a bit better than the original, and then we're going to do a lot more after that. So. Instead of this horrible type of, okay, a lot of text that makes me go blind, we have this. A little bit more visualization. You still have your text, the switch here, so, and here's the information. You see four CPUs on this box, and over here I put the mouse here, which shows you that this is actually the hello world. If you could see it, read it. So. Then I went through, I'm like, okay, I'm interested in certain, this is only, these, the sketch switch showed me that these were the only things that actually woke up in that sketch switch. These are the only things that actually ran during Hello World. So something else did some work for me. So whatever did that work for me must have ran. So now I can look at and do a task, select a task, it'll show you all the tasks. And I'm like, interesting, well, trace command, obviously that's running, we don't worry about it. So we ignore those. RCU preempt, um, I just know that I could, you, you might not know what that is, you might have selected and looked at it, I know better, so I know what RCU preempt does, so I'm like, nope, I can ignore that. Idle task, idle does nothing. So it's, well look, we have our terminal. I, by the way, I use XFCE if you haven't noticed. So I use, it's my terminal, so the terminal is important, because that must, that's what displays printf. And then we have two worker threads. And those are kernel threads. They're not user space threads. Those are actually the kernel created them. So you can't get rid of them. You can't kill them. So now you'll notice that it shows the CPUs, horrible resolution, but squint. Um, that's the terminal. These are two worker threads here. And here's all the way the work happened. Now, I'm, whoops, right? Yeah. Oh, but there's not much information there. And by the way, the reason why 
this is, I had, at first I thought this was a bug, and in fact I called Jordan up saying, there's a bug here. That, I say, wait a minute, this here is select, you can't really see, but that's the wake up, or that's the actual write, that's the write system call that the kernel, that uh, printf, or the uh, hello world did. But that's not, the, we saw all the uh, code before that, that wasn't the first thing it did. We, S -trace, or the, even strace showed you it did a lot of work before they did that first write. So why did it start here? And then I just realized, oh, because we only trace schedule, schedule switch, wake up, sked switch, and write. And when you run trace command, the way trace command works is it does a fork exec, or before it does a fork and exec, but before it does a fork, but before it does the exec, it enables tracing, does the exec. So it never did a sked switch. It enabled tracing and started executing. The first event to show up by Hello World was that syswrite. So according to the data we got, that's when it started. But since we have visualization, screw it. Let's record everything. So I just said, give me everything. Run hello. Boom! Got a lot more information there. It could be overwhelming. And actually, I had a, you don't see this, but I actually, and this was a debug kernel I ran this on, and I had uh, IRQ disabling and preemption disabling enabled, and basically, this was basically just IRQ and preempt disabled. <laughs> you didn't see anything else. I'm like, that's how I, I had to like turn off those events and run everything. So this is a lie. This is what Kernel Shark looks with that data. Now you see this here is hello, is way, I mean, that's where the, I marked where the, uh, the right was, and you see it does a lot of different other things. By the way, the preempt on and offs are enabled here. So, I want to zoom in. So I take my mouse, slide it over, boom, it shows you this. So, here's where the right is, and I'm going to look, if I look over, this is, you move over here, this guy my hello world woke up this kernel thread. So that's the wake up, and this is where it actually started executing. I could see, here's the transfer of information. This guy woke up, executed, so that I'm, it's following it. But what I did notice, I didn't even look at the trace, but just looking at kernel shark, I noticed one more thing. This guy woke up something else. And it woke up, you can't really tell, the terminal. So somewhere in between, there's a handoff. The my hello world passed something to a worker thread who passed something to the terminal. What is this terminal doing? So I went back and turned, enabled all system calls and ran the hello world only looking at what the terminal doing. Believe it or not, this is all it did. It did a few reads. It did, a, actually it was exit poll, because obviously it's in a, a poll loop. If you ever you know it's select and poll, it's just wait, sleep on a file descriptor, and when some information comes in, wake up and run. So it does a poll, it wake out of there, it wrote something. By the way, I looked at that before, and it's just garbage. I don't know what it wrote. But then it read something that looks in, mm, interesting. It read a lot. I don't even know what it read. And then it, let's see. So then it exa read, exa read, it wrote some more, then it did a receive message, and then went back into poll. That's interesting. Well, let's run the function graph tracer on sysread, because it read something. I want to see what it read. So it goes in, it goes, does all this fun, fun of all stuff. It does more. And I went and said, ooh, look at copy from read buff. That looks like an interesting function. Let me go dig a little deeper into that. So they looked at the code. This is a Linux co source code. So if you go to uh, 419 RC5, I didn't download the latest and greatest, which is 419 already released. We're in a new merge window, so 420, or maybe he'll call it 5.0 because Linus can't count more than his fingers and his toes. Um, so I saw this function. I was looking at the code, and it's, this is actually the full function. That fits on a slide. I love this. I love functions that fit on a slide. I didn't delete it. I, the only thing I did was there's a huge uh, comment above it. I like huge comments. It usually lets you know what the function is doing. And it's reading something from user space. Because you've noticed it has that little unsigned car user. So it's reading something from, or it's reading into user space. So it's actually, this is copy from read buffer, but it puts it into the user space. And notice down here, I noticed this thing, read buff adder, some crazy thing from some tail. So there's some, uh, looking at the head list, I'm like, hey, this is some sort of buffer. 
Maybe this is where my printf went to, and it's reading from it. Is it? Well, I want to know what this character string is. So I look at this function, and the second parameter is the, um, the, the thing I want to see. OK. What I did here was, now let's get into something a little bit more magical. Let's put in, let's create our own event. Remember in the beginning of the talk, I said the RSI register is the second parameter. Remember that? <clears throat> SI. This is a K-probe. This is a dynamic probe. What it does is it modifies the kernel code. You can actually put in a trace point anywhere in the kernel. Well, not almost anywhere. And then read information from it. And I put it at the start of that trace audit data file. And I said, OK, buff equals this is what I'm going to look at that register and convert it into a string. And that's nasty code to do. We we're trying to make this look better. That's one of the things I'm working on. I gave a talk in Edinburgh last week about how ugly this code is. So this is the second register, string. And I put it into sys kernel tracing, kprobe events. It created it. Then I ran trace command record e data, hello, and trace command report. This actually was a lot bigger, a lot full of crap. But look what I have here. Hello world with the address on it. It worked. The problem is, this was a buffer, and I said call it a string. And this is why I said don't do this at home. Because I put, if you go back to what this is, you know, actually, this guy is a void pointer. That from, and it's actually passing uh, n, which is a how much to read. So it's a void pointer telling you to read. This string has no null character at the end. So when I did it, told the k-probe to read everything, it just read a bunch of memory until it found a null character. So this actually was much bigger, but it made the slide so ugly that I got rid of it. But there, I found the full path from where my hello world sent something and then where it read. You'll never look at hello world the same again. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Oh, we have to throw. And by the way, okay, if you, to encourage questions, we'll give you one of these. Questions? <laughs> no questions. That must mean my talk was so good that no one, uh, you already got one. No, no, I heard, uh, no, I heard one question uh, from the audience, but the, uh, now they don't want to repeat it, so sorry. I'll repeat it for them. Uh, if I want to start with system programming, how, uh, where, where I can start? Wait, start what? With system programming, with, uh, like programming for the kernel. If you want to program for the kernel, where if would I you start? If I want start? to start, which is a good starting point? Um, that's a good question, because it's been so long since I did it. And when I did it, I did it. My first introduction was actually in school. We had, it was for the 2.0 kernel, so that tells you how old I was. And uh, I had to replace the TCP IP, the TCP IP stack from a, uh, a protocol that does send and acknowledge to a credit negative acknowledge protocol, uh, where we rip out all the things. Because TCP IP is very much a uh, bloated protocol made to run over an uh, unreliable network. So it's made, it's waiting for acts, and it's got windows changing and all this to make sure things move nicely. But when you have, when I have this box connected to that box going through a single switch, there's no, the packets will never come out of order. There's no reroute, there's no routing. It's just here to here, go fast. And my job for my school was simply to um, <clears throat> write, uh, write the negative, remove everything, and the credit negative acknowledgement is just say, this guy will say, or you say, I want to send you data, and this guy will say, okay, I got a megabyte of buffer, just start sending me. So I'll send everything, and when I'm done, I'm saying I'm done. And this guy will just receive everything, and if it misses a, pack, a package drop, it just sends a negative acknowledgement, says, I missed something, give me this again. So it would resend it. That's all the protocol basically is. I sped up uh, FTP by like 48%, almost double the price speed, uh, by transferring large data. So that's how I got involved with 
I, once I started doing this, I fell in love. I said I had to find something to do this. I looked for jobs doing this. So one way is basically, notice what I just did. This whole talk I did was just about something as simple as hello world is so complex. Think about that. So why tell people when they want to learn the kernel, if they want to become a kernel developer, find something so simple and see what the kernel does with it. Follow it, see if there's anything else that's interesting, and see if maybe you could do something better. So find out your own, you have to find your own scratch to itch. That's the problem. People come to me like, do you have a um, task for me to do? And I tell them, start playing with my code or whatever, start playing with the code, and find something that you don't like. This one, the, guy who, the guy who wrote Function Graph Tracer, Frederick Weisbecker, he started when he was in his 20s, uh, early 20s, 21, 22, and he, he didn't like his current major. Now, a lot of people like, you know, Jordan, who did this, he was a physicist. He switched from, he did a lot of work at CERN, programming, and said he likes programming better than physics. I don't blame him. And, and so he switched over. Frederick Weisbecker was theater and acting. That was his major. And said, ah, I want to be a programmer. Started looking at the Linux kernel, reading it, figured it out, started writing code. It's really up to you. So do the little things. Ftrace is great because Ftrace is a way you could see. I wish I had Ftrace when I was learning the kernel. I actually had to use grep. You know, <laughs> seriously, you hit a function pointer, grep, and then you find a function, then you say, you know, what you hit, will you be hitting a function pointer? So basically, you're following the line, you get to a thing, and it says, okay, this guy's calling this function, which, okay, off of some, so basically it has a, it takes a data structure that has a bunch of function pointers, and it called one of the functions in the function data structure. And I search that data structure, there's 70 or 80 of those data structures, all with their different functions. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I would put a print K, which is like the printf, inside the kernel to print what, what that guy called, run my program again, See a print K come out saying, oh, that's the function. Now go and trace it. Two steps later, another function of structure of another like 100 different things. Like, oh. It spent weeks trying to follow the flow here, where today you just turn on function graph tracer, run it, and you see all the functions that are being called in one shot. Any other questions? You get a thing over here. <laughs> Question about uh, F-Trace and uh, especially for uh, Trace Common 2. Uh, what I understand uh, when I try to debug it, because I tried. Uh, try to debug the tool or try to debug uh, the, kernel? The, the, the tool, <laughs> the tool, I mean. Okay, the tool's broken. Uh, no, I write perfect code, I'm sorry, it's not broken. Yeah, <laughs> and what I saw that uh, this uh, tool actually interacts uh, with uh, this uh, uh, Trace file system. Uh, so my question is, uh, is it possible uh, to <coughs> include some Linux kernel header in uh, some user space uh, <coughs> program and to interact with this, uh, with it, I mean? So do. Uh, so I, I mean to, <coughs> is it possible to uh, include some uh, Linux kernel header in, in some uh, user space uh, program to be able to receive all of those data which is trace it directly to the... Uh, so basically taking a kernel header mm -hmm. and include it into, I mean, I guess that's what a BPF trace kind of does. It takes um, a kernel header um, and includes it in the thing. Now the question is here, okay, you could do that. You have to build it. Yeah, gotcha. yeah, I got a little <laughs> feedback on the other one. So it takes the... the am I still on? Okay. It takes the, um, <clears throat> uh, the header file from the kernel you compile it into the other one, you get the same header files. Now, what happens if you run onto a different kernel where the header file is different? So, it doesn't work. Uh, so yeah. uh, what I would like instead is the, what we're working on too, by the way. By the way, kernel shark and ftrace are going to be wrappers around libraries. So, all the functionality that we have could be, it's going to be an LGPL library, and you'll be able to attach that to any application you want. So, once I get this shipped out to um, various distributions, you'll be able to, uh, if you write a program and you want to do tracing, 
you have to find a way to turn to root, but we have like a way, of, we're having ways to help you switch to root, but you have to type a password. And then um, execute tracing, record the data into the file, and analyze it in any tool you want. And even works with like Python tools. So Python will be able to do this. Uh, but say that doesn't answer your question about the structures and the headers to find out the, the data inside of a, the kernel. What we also want to work on is getting a dwarf parser. So all you need is access to, or a kernel built with dwarf information, and then you have a dwarf parser, that elf file that I talked about earlier, the debug dwarf, you know, elf, dwarf, the guy was, people are obviously Lord of the Rings fans. So dwarf is a way, is a thing inside the elf file that tells you where all the variables are, the structure layouts and everything else. So if you have a parser, you can say, okay, give me that function, give me that second parameter, and just t tell the dwarf, dwarf will tell you where those are, how to look at it, what registers they're in, and then you could add the trace points and be able to dynamically do all that stuff out. We're working on that. That's, that's our goal. Is actually, my goal is, like in Kernel Shark, to pop up a, um, Jordan probably doesn't even know this yet. <laughs> He's finding out about this now. One of my goals is this, pop up a, uh, bring up the file of the kernel. Like so, say go into the kernel directory of the currently running kernel, pop up a file, say click on this, I want this variable recorded. And then it will and say start and record, it will create a trace point using the probe onto the code, get the variable, reading dwarf, find out where it is, and you run your code and you actually see that variable pop you up. So you don't have to figure out what the variable is. You just look at the code and just kind of point and click. That's my, where I want to get to. So, okay. Anything else? Whoops, box here. Throw it. Uh, <clears throat> is it on? Yes. Uh, that part, yeah. Maybe yeah. not. Do you hear? Yep. Is it working? Yeah. Uh, how do things will go further with the code of conduct? Code of conduct. That's not a tracing question. Uh, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> uh, if you accept it, answer, please. Okay. So, uh, so the code of conduct. It's basically at the. I was in the maintainer summit. Now, how many people have heard of the code of conduct? And um, Linus, this whole thing. I'm uh, on the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. Um, maybe we should stop the recording. No, <laughs> that's fine, we record it. Uh, basically, this is public knowledge. Basically, we're saying is, it's in, the code of conduct is in there. Uh, what was said was basically a lot of people are upset or you know, are afraid about everything. And right now we're gonna say, let's see how things go. And let's not, let's not panic and do things over hearsay or you know these hypothetical problems. Let's see what actually happens. If there is a problem, we're going to then address the issues when the problem happens. Because uh, right now, really most likely, if you go back two years, it, seriously, it took about two years for a lot of people that are criticized, Linus and all that, to find something that would break the code of conduct. Two years. So that means for the last two years, we've been following the code of conduct. Uh, we just don't really, and a lot of people haven't realized that. And this is basically the code of conduct, is basically to show everyone we actually have changed. We, we've, we're not much different than we were a year ago. I mean, we are actually better, but for the last two years, the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel development community has been rather tame. Like, we are very much more professional. I think we just got older, we have kids. You know, we've learned how to deal with things. That's my own personal opinion. We are uh, great fans of uh, Linus Torvalds, of course, okay. and uh, uh, can we expect uh, uh, kernel version 2 with uh, Linus uh, Torvalds code of conduct and all developers go with him? Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, um, shall the Linux kernel be forward under new code, code of conduct, not this one? Like I said, um, what we're going to do we, is uh, uh, see where issues are. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. We noticed that the commits in uh, GitHub were really, really uh, small these days. 
So we heard that uh, committers will take their work back and will uh, uh, set up a new project under their That's rules. new to me. Uh, rumors only, like yeah. mock rumors, you know. I don't see that changing. I don't, um, I haven't heard that. That's the first I've heard of it. Um, I don't know anyone that's pulling out in there and doing things. I mean, um, they, we have an interpretation document that very much explains the way we're going. And it's one of those things where nobody likes it, which means it must be written right. So it's not, and it really comes down to the real, is a perception problem. Like I said, the Linux kernel has been really, really good and we have, we're not changing, but there's a perception that we need to change. The code of conduct helps change the perceptions that's saying, telling people we've been like this for two years. And it's not, Linus may not be swearing as much, but he already turned things down already. He's already said, no, you can't do it this way. And uh, yeah, he won't be as colorful. He won't be as, um, uh, you might, won't be as quotable. And that's a good thing. The problem, the, okay, the one thing I would let you everyone know, the one the problem with the Linux kernel community that no other open source um, project really has, we have a celebrity. Linus Torvalds was even invited to the Oscars. Okay, so he is a celebrity. People watch everything he says every day. Whenever he sends out an email, there's at least 100 reporters reading every single email. And we are in a glass bowl. No other project, uh, is there 100 or so reporters reading what, like the project leader's email? So when he gets, goes off on something, it gets into the headlines. And that makes us look bad. And the problem is we are trying to be inclusive. We want people from China, uh, India, uh, the Asian countries, uh, lots of countries there. And we can do a lot without having the big, you know, retroactively aborted comments. It's clever. So maybe if you, you know, see Linus or something, just, you know, tell him one time, hey, come on, insult me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. That's Well, thank you. <laughs> By the way, you two get them, but first come, first serve. If you guys want any dice, there's a mistake on it. You have to figure out what the mistake is. I'll give you one. <laughs> and you get one. 